Gambia, Angola, China Holding, Gosh, producers of the finest tomato paste in the Gambia, Jeja Tomato Paste, available in 5 kilos, 1 kilo and in sachets. For wholesale and retail, visit our factory at Banjulanding. We are also producers of Jeja Mineral Water, cool, clear and fresh. Gosh, Gambia, Angola, China Holding, with headquarters at Fatu Golden Plaza, Mile 7, Bertel Harding Highway. Gosh Group also provides the best security company. Gash Security for your offices, warehouses, homes, and personal property. Gash Group for all your construction projects, offering you quality water reticulation for your gardens, pump irrigation, tidal irrigation projects, and all types of buildings. You can contact Gash on 396 7894 7003 373 0259. Visit us at Gash Global Group on Battle Harden Highway, Fatu Golden Plaza. Our website www.gashglobal.com. Gambia, Angola, China Holding. Gosh. It's a warm reception to our studios here in Serekunda. This is Star TV News with me, Sarah Kamara. In the headlines tonight, Minister of Agriculture, 23 communities in Yamina benefit from fertilizers and seeds. Davori elected UDP Secretary General and Standard Bearer of the party. On the international scene, China declares victory on absolute poverty, critics skeptical. France ban on UK fight causes chaos at Davenport port. Al Jazeera journalists hacked using Israel farms spyware. Those were the headlines and now the news in detail. The Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Ami Fabre, while speaking at Nyamina, is expounded on our ministry's activity in enhancing productivity in agriculture, as he mentioned about 23 communities in Nyamina which benefited from free fertilizers and seedling. So he said that the donkeys and horses that were provided for the communities upon request were in addition to the fertilizers and seedlings. Maria Madam tells us more. Minister Fabra made this statement shortly after the opposition National Assembly member for GDC, Omar Sisse, called on the government to help farmers while informing the president of the needs of the people of his constituency in Yamina East. President, my life is Fabri denied the allegations that there is no improvement in supporting farmers as he reminded the gathering about the recent increase of groundnut price this year, stressing that this year's price has not been seen in the Gambia for over 50 years. And contrary to the claims that the donkeys and horses given to farmers upon their request are not desirable, the minister defended that these animals are very important for the communities in the region, emphasizing that not all farmers can be provided with power tillers and tractors, thus the importance of the donkeys. <laughs> Minister Fabre further noted that Barrow knows the importance of agriculture in the Gambia's economy, which is why supporting farmers is part of his priorities. See further assault farmers of new 50 tractors to be distributed among themselves in due time. President Barrow also reiterated his government's full support to the farmers. The government will never back down in its efforts to boost agriculture productivity by creating motives and supply of farm equipment, adding that the evidence is the subsidy on fertilizers for the farmers. For Star TV News, I am Maria Madam. The United Democratic Party in a Congress held over the weekend elected lawyer Usino Dabo as the Secretary General and the Standard Bearer of the party for the upcoming presidential election. Zakin Kole reports. The Congress was held at a hotel beginning from the 18th to 19th December 2020. Speaking to the party militants, Usain Udabo said as they adjusted to the new normal, the year 2020 will be equally a crucial year for their party and the country. He added that 
2021 is an election year, an election that is about the future of the country. He added that, in the same vein, he appeals to all his party militants to be united with social cohesion and national unity. He also urged Gambians to be patriotic, come together collectively, saddle and brace up for 2020. Meanwhile, the United Democratic Party was formed in 1996, led by lawyer Usenu Dabo, with an ideology of social liberalism, constitutionalism and liberal democracy. As a party leader and candidate in the presidential election of 2001, Usainu came out second with 32.6% of the popular vote. He came out second place again in the 2006 presidential election with 26.7% of the votes. In 2007 parliamentary elections, the party won 4 out of 48 seats. Currently, the party holds 31 seats at the parliament out of 53. Jacqueline Colley, reporting for Star TV News. Those were the local stories. We'll be back with international news after the short break. Gambia, Angola, China holding Gash, producers of the finest tomato paste in the Gambia. Jaja tomato paste, available in 5 kilos, 1 kilo and in sachets. For wholesale and retail, visit our factory at Banjulanding. We are also producers of Jaja mineral water, cool, clear and fresh. Gash, Gambia, Angola, China holding, with headquarters at Fatu Golden Plaza, Mile 7, Bertel Harding Highway. Gash Group also provides the best security company Gash Security for your offices, warehouses, homes, and personal property. Gash Group for all your construction projects, offering you quality water reticulation for your gardens, pump irrigation, tidal irrigation projects, and all types of buildings. You can contact Gash on 396 7894 7003 373 0259. Visit us at Gash Global Group on Battle Highway, Fatu. Golden Plaza, our website www.gashglobal.com. Gambia, Angola, China holding Gash. And now beyond our borders. Chinese officials say President Xi Jinping has achieved his goals of eradicating extreme poverty nationwide by 2020. Over the past five years, the Communist Party has spent billions of dollars and despite thousands of officials to survey and help rural households. But critics question the sustainability of the program, claiming millions are at risk of falling back into hardship. Al Jazeera's Katrina Yu reports from Luncheng County in China. Luncheng County in China's south is known for its mountains, its rivers, and its poverty. Chen Shouzhi was among those once struggling to get by. Living in this dilapidated house, she struggled to raise enough money to send her two children to school. But she says thanks to the Chinese government, her life has been transformed. She's been given a new home in town and left this old farmhouse behind. This is how most people here used to live, in crumbling buildings built about 50 years ago without any water or electricity. This area is also deep in the mountains and far away from any essential services, including hospitals. During the past five years, millions of people in rural China have been relocated to apartment buildings in upgraded townships. Here, almost everything is new, including the roads and the schools. Chen moved here in 2018. My son told me that he doesn't want to go back to the old house again. It was dark and dirty and had many rats. They say our new home is clean and bright. Beijing has spent more than $20 billion this year to meet President Xi Jinping's deadline of eradicating extreme poverty nationwide by the end of 2020. Communist Party officials say they've succeeded. People used to have few options. Roads were bad. It was hard to find jobs outside farming. Good health care and education were scarce. Now they basically live in the same conditions as people in cities. The quality of life has rapidly improved. But not everyone has benefited. Some have been unable to adjust to life in the towns. Others say they've been forced to relocate. Analysts have also questioned the sustainability of the program, saying millions risk falling back into poverty. Poverty by nature for many people is transient, it's temporary, it's short-term spells. And those kinds of people have very, very different kinds of needs than others for whom poverty is a chronic experience. The policy implement the policy response to those different states needs to be different. 
Chen Shouzhi says life is better, but not easier. Her new job in a nearby factory involves working 12 hours a day, with only two days off per month. But the sacrifice, she says, is worth it. She's making the most of the new opportunities, in the hope her children might have better ones. Katrina Yu, Al Jazeera, Luotong County, China. France ban on transport to and for UK over the emission coronavirus strain has brought much of its cargo movement to a halt, leaving trucks carrying French essential goods and produce stranded at the border. The British government said food and medicine supplies are sufficient for now, but the food industry is warning that some fresh products might run out in days if goods do not start moving again soon. The cold waters of the English Channel have rarely seemed more of a barrier. Dover is usually one of the busiest ports in the world, but the UK is now cut off from much of it. Countries scared by the UK's infectious new Covid strain have imposed travel bans. France has also banned the transport of accompanied freight. This is the result, kilometre after kilometre of stranded lorries and drivers not knowing when they'll make it home. I have three children and wife and uh, they, they need me to come for Christmas. Christmas in Poland is a very special uh, holiday. It's uh, bind with religion and uh, uh, traditional. It's uh, for Polish people, it's uh, very hard to be away on Christmas. So this situation uh, cost me very hard. On the Dover seafront, a line of vans with Romanians, not knowing when they'll make it home. We've been waiting, you know, and we don't have enough money to spend money, you know, and things like that. We want, because we're waiting, we're sleeping in the car, you know. We want everybody to be all right. For the British, this compounds the sense of unease already brought on by tough new coronavirus restrictions and the effective cancellation of family Christmas celebrations for millions. In recent memory, the UK has never felt so isolated, so lonely, so atomized with people cut off from each other. And now with a new travel ban, people cut off from much of the rest of the world. And this is perhaps just a small foretaste of what might be coming if the United Kingdom cannot reach a deal with its European partners by the end of the year. The government says food and medicine supplies are sufficient for now, but there are warnings from the food industry that some fresh products might run out in days if goods don't start moving again soon. Rory Challens, Al Jazeera, Dover. Meanwhile, dozens of journalists at Al Jazeera's media network were targeted this year by advanced spyware sold by Israel's farmware in an attack likely linked to the government of Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, a cyber security watchdog said. Citizens Lab researchers at the University of Toronto published a report on Sunday detailing how NSO groups Pegasus spyware infected the mobile phones of 36 journalists, producers and anchors and executives at the media network, which has its headquarters in Qatar. The cyber security watchdog attributed the unprecedented attack to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. More on this report by Al Jazeera. Spyware sold by an Israeli private intelligence firm has been used to hack the phones of dozens of Al Jazeera journalists. That's according to Citizen Lab researchers at the University of Toronto. The digital security watchdog says the unprecedented cyber attack is likely to have been ordered by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Investigators say mobile phones were infiltrated with malicious codes, which uploaded data onto foreign servers. Let's now speak to Tamir Al-Mishal. He's an Al Jazeera investigative journalist. He's joining us from Doha. Tamir, thanks for your time. So this alleged hack was discovered after you launched an investigation with Citizen Lab. Talk us through what you discovered and what prompted that investigation. Thank you, Darin. Yes, we started this investigation last uh, January. It wasn't an easy one. It was very complicated. We put a uh, uh, phone uh, that we are using in our investigation program, Makhafi Adam tip of the iceberg, on monitoring and tracking in cooperation with uh, the well-known Canadian lab, Citizen Lab. We put this phone after we received uh, uh, threats 
on this phone from different numbers, unknown numbers, and through even uh, different applications, threatening us to hack our phones after sensitive issues we were investigating in this uh, program. Uh, we put this uh, uh, phone and we start to investigate this issue. In July, last July, in uh, 19th of July, we received an urgent call from Citizen Lab saying that our phone has been hacked. And uh, the, in terms of time, the interesting point here, Darin, that this, in, this hacking just came after we published a story in July, uh, an investigation program on the story of the well-known uh, uh, Indian investor and businessman B. R. Shetty, who has uh, who has escaped from UEE after a scandal there, and uh, we has been hacked uh, uh, through this uh, by this phone. After or th we ha the, our phone has been hacked immediately after we published this investigation, and through this phone we called in this investigation we called an uh, Marathi uh, official parties and non-official parties from this phone to give them the right of reply on our investigation on PR shitty story, uh, and the other interesting point in this uh, hacking, uh, Darin, that uh, uh, it has been hacked by a technique and a spyware, well-known spyware is called Pegasus, and a technique zero click. Because through the timing of observing and tracking our phone, we didn't click on any suspicious link. But by this uh, technique, you don't need to click on any uh, suspicious link. They it managed to hack our phones by a zero click technique based on the Citizen Lab uh, investigation and uh, researches. Uh, and Tamim, also, you said the allegation is that this could have been ordered by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. I mean, how was that conclusion reached and how do you go about discovering that? This is based on the investigations and the researches and uh, the database and analysis of Citizen Lab, who they discovered first, uh, first the Pegasus uh, spyware in uh, 2016, and they followed different cases, and they are specialized in this uh, in this field. And we follow uh, follow with uh, them with their investigations and database and the comparison with other uh, in, uh, hacking uh, took place before. And uh, a very important point in this hacking that wasn't just our phone in uh, the in, uh, in the program Mahafi Yadam tip of iceberg. We discovered the same technique and the same spyware has been used to hack and spy on the other 36 uh, colleagues in the Al Jazeera network. So it was a campaign uh, and it was a different uh, ways of hacking and different targets and different numbers and phones. Mm -hmm. so Why do you, so what is the message you think behind the, uh, the hacking and what do you think is the impact on journalists like yourself and the other 36 colleagues at Al Jazeera when they are hacked and when private information is effectively weaponized? Simply, we are doing our professional uh, work. We are journalists. We are investigating different issues. Uh, is this is uh, an, a reason, a justification to pay the price to be hacked? Uh, and the other thing, that the aftermath and the consequences of this hacking is very dangerous. They are, they are controlling your phone. They can access any application. They can control uh, the cameras and, the, and they can listen to the meetings, the, everything. By because we put this uh, phone on tracking and observation, we managed to discover uh, this hacking in its time, and to avoid uh, to any leaking of our informations and our uh, any important uh, uh, informations regarding our work. In other cases, we investigating in this investigation. We investigate a case of a journalist based in London. She discovered after at least uh, eight to nine months. So for nine months, they managed to hack and spy on her uh, phones and all of uh, all the content of her phones. So it's very dangerous. In some cases, we have journalists have been disappeared after being uh, uh, hacked and spy on their phones. We have journalists have been killed. And we have a case of a journalist have been arrested. The consequences is very dangerous, and it's a violation of human rights, and it's a crime against journalism. We were investigating a story that to expose it to the audience. Right. And in the end, unfortunately, we move to be a victim. Okay, Tamar al Mashal, we thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you. That's all for this edition of the news. Do join us tomorrow for more news. Please stay tuned and enjoy the rest of our programs. Thank you.